Our gracious Father, we want to thank you once again for granting us the grace to come into your presence. Lord, you said, you give us an invitation. You said, come unto me, all ye that labor, and I heavily laden and that you will give us rest. You've asked us to take upon ourselves your yoke. And we know that that yoke is a yoke of study. Say, so learn of me, and you shall find a rest unto your soul. And so tonight, Lord, in obedience to your word, as you have come to sit at your feet, Lord Jesus, and to learn of you, may we find rest to our souls, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of our times. We live, Lord, in uncertain times. We live, Lord God, in days where hearts of men are being perplexed because of so many uncertainties, because of fear, because of the unknown, and because of insecurity. But Lord, we thank you, Father, for the provision that we have in your word that guarantees stability. Your word brings tranquility. Your word brings refreshing. And so as you have come tonight, O oh God, to drink, O oh God, to, uh, to, to, to receive, O oh God, of, of the manna from heaven. Lord, may our souls be refreshed. May our spirits be refreshed in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, that you will grant us access into your word in the name of Jesus Christ. No man knows the things of a man except the spirit of that man. So also the things of God knoweth no man except by the spirit of God. The Holy Spirit eyes up on you. We ask that you will unfold to us th those things that have been freely given to us by God and that you will grant us deep revelation of them. Thank you, Father, because you know you have answered our prayers. Because you have prayed with faith and thanksgiving. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. I want to welcome us to tonight's online discipleship Bible study. And for those that have joined us in the past, you um, remember that we have been on a series of study. And the particular topic that we have been looking at for the past few weeks has been the metaphors that Apostle Paul by the Spirit has used in the book of Ephesians to describe God's people. Um, and we have titled this series The Seven Pictures of the Church or The Seven Pictures of God's People. We have been privileged to uh, look at the picture of the assembly. We've also looked at the picture of uh, the church being the body, the body of Christ. We have looked at uh, workmanship as a picture. And uh, we have also looked at the temple, the church being the temple, God's people uh, being referred to as the temple of God. And today we want to look yet at another picture, the picture of the church, God's people being the bride of Christ, the bride of Christ. That's what we will be looking at today. And like I did say earlier, that all of these seven pictures are found in Pauline's epistle to the church at Ephesus and so we'll be making references to Ephesians the book of Ephesians tonight where the picture of the bride is found I want to begin tonight by 
looking at the bride's relation to Christ. What exactly is the relationship between the bride, the church, and Christ? And the very first point we want to examine is the fact that the wife, the wife is her husband's glory. And so the church is also God's glory. Let me read please from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians 11 verse number 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. There is a, a particular order of relationship here. There is, a, there is a hierarchy of relationship here that I believe is very, very significant. You know, we are talking about the relationship between the bride and Christ. So God has given us a divine order here of a relationship. And that order is the fact that God is the very head of Christ. And because God is the head of Christ, little wonder in the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ when he was here on planet earth in in his humanity he was subject totally to God to his father he never did anything he said of my own I can do nothing he, he, all his judgments all his decisions they were at the initiative of the father he never did anything of his own volition. So he was totally submissive to the will of the Father. So it's in that sense that God was the head of Christ. So also, the man is the head of the woman. The man is the head of the woman. It's important also for us to understand this particular order you know and because the man is the head of the woman the woman has a god-given responsibility in scriptures to submit to her head to submit to her head who is the man but let us also not miss out the fact that that submission would work as long as the man himself recognizes the fact that Christ is his own head. You see, so that's the other. God is the head of Christ, so our Lord Jesus Christ is submitted and is totally yielded to God. Also, Christ is the head of the man. So the man must be totally yielded and submitted to Christ. And for a man who is totally yielded and submitted to Christ, that man is not very likely to have an issue with the wife being submitted to him. So as the, Christ is the head of the man, so of a necessity too, God has made the man to be the head of the wife. What I'm saying here, the key point is that the woman would naturally submit to a man who himself is submitted to Christ as his head. So that is uh, very, very significant. It is usually when there is a crisis of headship that submission becomes a problem, a challenge. When you see a man who is not submitted to Christ as his head, the chances are that the wife you know, might also find it difficult. Not in all cases, but there's a possibility that the wife too might find it difficult to submit to the headship of that man. So God has put that order in place so that everything can work perfectly. Now, 
verse 7 now that's first corinthians 11 verse 7 says for a man indeed ought not to cover his head a man ought not to cover his head for as much as is the image and the glory of god but the woman is the glory of the man the woman is the glory of the man when the man appears before christ he needs not cover his head why because his head is christ and the glory of christ must not be covered it must not be hidden so when a man appears in praying in prayers or in prophesying before christ with his head his head does not need to cover that glory of christ must be manifest however when it comes to the woman you know uh, she must cover because her head is man and the glory of man must not be manifest when the woman comes to pray or to prophesy this is only applicable in the place of praying and prophesying that the woman's head must be covered because the man is the head and that must not show forth or be manifested when the woman is in the presence of god praying or manifested so spiritually when we look you know at this first corinthians 11 is uh, the significant point really is the issue of which glory must show forth but the point i want to emphasize here is that the woman is the glory of the man so because the woman is the glory of the man so also the church or the bride of christ is the glory of christ i want us to uh, understand that that the church is christ's glory so when you are looking for the glory of christ you must find it in the church that's what that scripture is saying when you want to see how glorious christ is how glorious the life of christ is how glorious the person of jesus is you know the bible says something that i like so much when it was describing jesus he said he who being i think somewhere in Colossians, say who being the brightness of god's glory jesus christ was described as the brightness of the glory of the father who is his own head who being the brightness of his glory of god's glory and the express image of god's person or personality so because god was jesus's head Jesus radiated the glory of his head. And Jesus also, you know, was the express image, personality of, of, the, of, of the Father. So that when you see Jesus, you have seen the Father. It's in the same dimension that the church is meant to be the express, the brightness of the glory of Christ. So that when men, when they see the church, uh, they say, we can behold the glory of Christ in these people. So also the church is meant to be the express image of the person of Christ. So that when people see us, they see Christ. That is the divine pattern. That is the relationship, what is meant to be. And that is why we are looking at this uh, picture. You know, in all of these uh, studies, we first look at what, what is the essential, wh why is God putting that picture in place? What does God want to achieve by using this scriptural metaphor to describe God's people? So here we are saying that the, what God wants to achieve is so that God can display the glory of Christ through it, the bride, through the church, to the world. God wants to showcase who Jesus is to the world. And so God has de uh, decided to do that by showcasing the glory of Christ in the person of the church or through the bride of Christ, which is uh, the church. So that's what God wants to achieve. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 12. Ephesians 1, uh, the 12th verse says, That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. 
we should be to the praise of God's glory. Those of us who first trusted in Christ. So God wants the church to radiate glory. And by that glory, we are talking about the nature of Christ. We are talking about the life of Christ. We are talking about that which the world will see. And they will, and they will form a good opinion. See, the word glory is kabod, you know, in Hebrew. You know, and, but it means doxa in Greek. It's a weight. It also talks about, you know, the response. A response that engenders good opinion. That when people see something and they form a good opinion about that, and that's glory. You know, it's it's always a good opinion of something. That's glory. That uh, uh, doxa, another meaning of doxa, it's good opinion. So we are saying that when when the world views the church, they should have a good opinion of of the church by the virtue of what they see, by virtue of the life of Christ they see, by virtue of you know the the person of Jesus in the church, in, in the bride of Christ. They should have a good, form a good opinion of who Jesus is. And uh, in Ephesians chapter 5, let's read verses 26 to 27. Ephesians 5, 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the world. So there is a, a work, an ongoing work that Jesus Christ is doing in his church. If I let me uh, um, go a verse uh, uh, back to verse 25. See, husbands, love your wife, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. You see, the uh, marriage relationship between the husband and the wife is a microcosm. It's a very small representation of the relationship between Jesus and the church. God wanted us to understand that there is going to be a time when Christ will, you know, have a relationship with his, his own people, the body of, of Christ or his bride. And because God wanted to convey this spiritual relationship, this spiritual truth, it's part of the reason why he has instituted the marriage institution, the relationship between the husband and the wife, to illustrate the closeness, the affinity the intimacy, the companionship that should exist between a man and a woman, between a husband and a wife. That that same companionship is what God expects to exist between Christ as well as the believers. It's one of the major reasons why marriage is instituted. And so here, you know, husbands are being enjoined to love their wives. And because the marriage relationship is a reflection on a small scale of the relation between Christ and and, and his church, that is always the standard for measuring what our responsibility in our own marital relationship should always be. Every time the Bible is, is describing the relationship of the husband, he will always liken it to Christ. Every time the Bible is also describing the responsibilities of the wife, he will also liken it to Christ. Say here, husband, they should love their wives. How? It didn't end there. If it has ended there, then it's not helpful. He has to give us a standard to measure I'm a husband. How should I love my wife? And that standard is always the standard of Christ. Say, husband, love your wife, even as Christ. That's the standard. Even as Christ also loved the church. Not as any other person loves it. Not as society defines love. You see, because this is part of the problems of the crisis we have in marriage, marriages today. People, uh, the society is redefining marriage, is redefining love, is redefining responsibility, who is the head and what's the role of the wife. And many people are buying into those lies, into the falsehood. Not knowing that God who instituted the God who is the author already have his own guideline. He has his manual and the manual for, you know, uh, how a marriage should work, how a godly marriage should work, is the Bible. So, and the manual says the husband should love the wife as Christ loved the church. That's the standard. And give himself for it. That is the evidence of that love. And then he also tells us the reason why he did that, verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, 
That is the ultimate, what Jesus wanted to achieve, to present to himself a glorious church, not having spots or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So when we talk about glory, there is a glorious church. It's a church that is without spots, a church without wrinkle. You know, spots talking about inward moral, uh, 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 moral issues. Inward moral uh, uh, defects. That those are the spots. And when we talk about you know the the wrinkles, they are on the surface. You know the the misdeeds and the the and and the and the misbehaviors that we see. They should be free of any of such things, so that that church can be glorious and it can be holy. And that is the kind of bride also that is coming for. That is this definition of glory without spots and without wrinkle. Let's move on. Now, the second thing I want us to see, and I've mentioned that also, is that marriage is a great ministry, a, a great mystery. The great ministry of marriage is a depiction of the union, this indivisible union between Christ and our bride, the church. It's a mystery. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 32 to 33. This is a great, uh, permit me please to read from verse 31. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they two shall be one flesh. This is now that mystery, the ministry that one plus one does not equal two. It's a mystery. The, you know, that in God's own mathematics or arithmetic, whichever way you look at it, that one plus one equals one. That is what is called the mystery. It says that a, a man shall leave his father, he will leave his mother, and they shall be joined unto his wife. You'd have thought they should become two, you know. But then he say, and they too shall then become one flesh. After they are coming together, after being joined, they become one. So it's talking about a union, a unity. Then it says in verse 2, this is a great mystery. A mystery of one joining being joined to one then becoming one say but i speak concerning christ and the church you can see that that's just a representation on an earthly plane you know it's not taking it into the spiritual that i'm using this analogy of a man being married to a wife to to speak about the way christ is also uh, being married to the church Verse 33, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. So that great mystery is also reflected in the relationship of the union of Christ and uh, the bride. Now I want us to look at uh, uh, the four stages of an ancient Jewish uh, wedding. And that will help us to really understand uh, our responsibilities as the bride of Christ, especially at this time, because uh, the church or God's people, we are in a period, we are in a period between expo exposure and wedding and marriage. Um, the, that's why we are the bride. We are not yet the church of Christ. Is not yet the wife of Christ in the same way that Israel was the wife of Jehovah. Because in the Old Testament, God called, you know, Abraham and through Abraham, you know, he called the nation unto himself. He became married to that nation. And on Sinai, a, a contract, a, a, a covenant contract was enacted between God being the husband and Israel being his wife. So you could say that the church in the wilderness, Israel, was actually the wife of God. And that's why every time God will be saying, you know, to Israel that, uh, you know, they've committed wardom, that they have committed idolatry. Every time they turn their backs against God and started worshiping idols and, you know, imitating all the idolatry of uh, those Canaanitic nations that they found themselves living in their land or amongst them. You know, God always kept on saying that I'm your husband, I'm your husband, but then you have committed wardom, you've committed, you know, halotry and all of that. God was using that in a spiritual sense. Why? Because 
in, indeed he was married to Israel. Israel was God's wife. But the church is not yet in that, uh, uh, cannot be said to be in the same uh, situation, in the sense that at the moment, we have been espoused, we've been betrothed to Christ. And we shall understand that when we look at these four stages of an ancient Jewish wedding. It's not something that is commonly practiced today, even though there might still be some of the elements you know, being done in Jewish societies today. But this used to happen in the Bible days. The very first stage is the betrothal stage. The betrothal stage. What in Western culture is the, the near, near, nearest to betrothal in the Jewish setting is what we call the engagement in the Western culture. Even though this betrothal, it takes a, on a bit more seriousness and sobriety than the engagement, but it, it's nevertheless something like an engagement. A betrothal, and what is the betrothal? It, this was binding. And it could only be undone by a divorce when there is a proper reason or a proper ground. The engagement or the betrothal could be undone. As long as there is a proper ground, divorce was permissible. Such, and the ground that was permissible would be when the bride was no longer found to be pure. When the bride was no longer found to be pure. And uh, see, this is the picture we saw in Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, we know that uh, Mary had been espoused to Joseph. You know, um, she, they were planning to get married. But then uh, the, Mary came up with the story that indeed uh, she was pregnant. And that... Uh, you know, became a shock to Joseph because they hadn't really been intimate at this time because it was still the period of their uh, espousal. Uh, verse 18 says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, take note, so they had not even been become intimate, you know, in a sexual uh, uh, form. There was no sexual intimacy yet. Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. That would have been an aberration. That would have been a taboo. You know, what that simply meant was that Joseph would have thought this woman is, is defiled herself. She's deceived me. She was meant to get married to me, but she, she must have slept with someone else. So she's actually become impure. And so, she, so Joseph had a very solid ground. It was on this ground that she could easily put her away and, and divorce her. He had a very solid ground. Verse 19, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away uh, uh, privily. Uh, putting her away there actually meant uh, to divorce her. He was actually planning to do the right thing, except that the Holy Spirit, uh, sorry, the angel came in and then convinced her that, look, in this case, it's not that uh, she had cheated on you, you know, that Mary had cheated on Joseph. You, you, you have to be convinced that, look, she was actually pregnant of the Holy Ghost. And that this was an exceptional miracle that God was trying to perform. So that is the background here. You know, that there was an espouser. And that espouser was normally binding. Almost invariably, it would culminate into marriage. The only ground for the divorce or separation would be when the woman or the bride is found to have defiled herself through sexual immorality. And it was this question that the Pharisees brought to tempt Jesus in Matthew chapter 19, which unfortunately is causing a lot of uh, misinterpretation among Christians today. Um, Matthew chapter 19, um, a few verses I'll read uh, because of time. Verses, uh, I'll just read from verses 3 to 9. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? So they were talking about divorce here. The same expression, to put away for every cause. And he, referring to Jesus, answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning, he made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, 
and they twain shall be one flesh. We've read that in Genesis, you know, uh, which is where originally God um, uh, gave this uh, uh, instruction, this mystery. But six, therefore there are no more twain or two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Verse seven, they say unto unto him, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? In other words, Moses said, look, you could just give her a letter saying, look, you're divorced. And then once that letter is given, she, you know, yeah, you, you have, you have, you have the, 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 the union can come to an end. But it is said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And we know that God's original plan and, you know, uh, for marriage was the beginning before the fall. That's his original plan. That's his eternal plan for marriage was before the fall. And we thank God that Jesus Christ has, you know, clarified it. There is no ambiguity here that marriage as ordained by God before the fall, marriage as instituted by God himself, there is no basis at all whatsoever. There's no room, no ground, no basis whatsoever for divorce or for being or for putting away. There is no basis. That's what Jesus is saying here, that in the beginning, it was not so. What was not so is that there was no uh, divorce permissible in the beginning. And then in verse um, 9, And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, take note, for fornication, and shall marry another committed adultery. And whoso marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. So, so Christ is emphasizing the same thing that we are talking about here, that the only ground for which a woman, a man can put a woman away is after that they have been, uh, uh, after they are betrothed, after the man is betrothed to the, the, the woman, the bride, before marriage is consummated. Take note that there are four stages. This is just the first stage. There's no marriage yet. It's just engagement. After they're engaged and the man discovers that the woman is impaired, she's been defiled, she's committed fornication, which is outside of marriage. Because he said, except for fornication, which we believe that that's only committed between unmarried partners, two unmarried partners. You know, so there's no marriage here. If that happens, Jesus says here, according to your, your tradition, Jewish tradition, it is permissible for a man to put the woman away for that reason. But if a man does otherwise, if there is no issue of defilement or sexual you know, uh, immorality or fornication, and he does that within the ancient Jewish culture, then the man is going to commit adultery. If he then goes ahead, gets a spouse to another woman, and then marries. And if the woman also goes ahead and gets a spouse to another man and marries, both of them will be committing adultery. Now, the standard for us, and I'll still come to that as we move on further here, is that this is not applicable to Christian marriage. Why? Because this is an ancient Jewish culture, and this is the very first stage that this is you know, bound to happen. So it's like saying that in our culture, you can break an engagement. Yes, it's permissible. That's what he's saying here. On the basis of fornication or immorality, engagement can be broken. Yes, that's what that would be the interpretation today to this practice back then in the ancient Jewish culture that an engagement can be broken. But we know that once marriage is consummated today, there is no basis whatsoever for divorce. And we cannot use this excuse, you know, or this reason of uh, sexual uh, immorality or fornication as a ground. For putting away. No, there's no ground uh, as far as uh, Christian uh, marriage in the contemporary, in to, uh, today's uh, 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 culture is concerned. Now, the young man prepared a ketuba or a, a ketuba, you know, that thing that's around pronunciation, a ketuba, or a marriage contract or a covenant 
which he presented to the intended bride and her father. So the man comes to the house of the intended bride and he presents like a, a marriage contract, showing that, look, I want to marry you. Included in this contract was the bride price. So the bride price had to be included, whatever that is that he wanted to pay. And, and that has to be appropriate compensation to the parents for the cost of raising up their, uh, their daughter or the bride, as well also as an expression of his love for her. That's what that uh, bride price uh, 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 would represent. We also, for us, uh, who are the bride of Christ under the New Testament, we have also been bought with a price. You see, the betrothal between uh, Jesus and the church is a picture of our salvation. At what point are we betrothed to Christ? It is at the point when we became saved. When we, when, we, when, we, when we express our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and we receive the gift of eternal life, we become born again. That is the point that we become engaged to uh, Christ. That's the point we became the bride of Christ. Each and every one of us were, were saved. And the price that was also paid for buying, buying us over the bright price was the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is what 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 20 says. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 20. For ye are bought with a price. That's the, that's the bright price, brethren. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You are bought with a price, then glorify God. Because now you, you are no longer yourself. You are no longer your own. You don't belong to yourself. Your body and all that you have belongs to the one that has bought you, uh, which is God. And the price paid for that is the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. I believe this is what Jesus Christ is referencing when he said on the cross, Tetelestai, Tetelestai. And Tetelestai means it is finished. It is finished. In the ancient Greek uh, of the New Testament, when a bill that you are owing is paid, they put a stamp on that bill. It can be a debt, you know, a certificate. It can be an, a receipt, you know, that you are owing. Once that uh, thing that you you, you bought uh, is is once you have been able to make that payment, they just bring out the receipt and they put a stamp on on it, uh, paid in full. They stamp it paid in full, you know, and that is what. Uh, the idea of it is finished means. It means that our salvation and redemption has been paid for totally in full, full settlement. And that's what Jesus said on the cross. And we know that the, uh, the payment that he made was the, the shed blood. Now, the second stage of this ancient Jewish wedding is the acceptance of the proposal. Because what the bridegroom has done is going to the family and then proposing to the family. Uh, as the woman, uh, and of course, asking for the father of the bride uh, for the acceptance of that proposal. So, so that acceptance, to see the proposal was accepted, the young man, uh, the bridegroom, would pour a, a cup of wine for his beloved and wait to see if she drank it. This cup represents a blood covenant. Remember that he's come with a marriage contract or covenant and then in order to seal that covenant, in order to offer her, you know, uh, 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 this proposal of, of, of marriage, they will try and solemnize it or seal it up with a cup of wine. She will give it to the bride. The bride will drink it. Once she drinks it, it represents a covenant is enacted. She has accepted the proposal uh, for marriage. If she drank the cup, she would have, she would have accepted the bride and she would be betrothed. The young man would then give gifts to his beloved and then take his leave. He would just give it a gift and then he will leave. The young man would have to wait for him to return and to collect her. When a person by faith receives Jesus Christ as their savior and partakes in the communion, it's a picture of the bride accepting the proposal of the bridegroom. And uh, 
that's the reason why also I believe Jesus Christ enacted this ordinance before he died, the ordinance of uh, the communion with his disciples, those who have trusted in him, those who believed in him. And we see that recorded for us in Matthew chapter 26, verse 28. Matthew 26, 24. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So it's the blood of the new covenant. That communion blood that we take representing the shed blood of Jesus Christ and the bread representing his broken body, there, is, there are emblems of this new covenant. And when we are after we are saved, when we begin to partake of it, let's partake of it as those who are reenacting and renewing that covenant relationship that we have with, with our bridegroom as bride of Christ. That's all we are trying to do. We are trying, we are affirming the fact that, look, look, you have proposed to us, you have saved us, and we have accepted your proposal. We are your bride, Jesus. And we are demonstrating that by partaking of this wine and partaking of uh, the, the bread. Now, the third stage after this acceptance of the proposal by the bride and the father is that the wedding chamber has to be prepared. You know, there's a wedding shimbad, and there is also the bit which is commonly practiced today. It's called the chupa. Now, before leaving, the young man would announce after the acceptance, before he leaves to go back to you know wherever he comes from, the young man he will announce, it, "I'm going to prepare a place for you." He will announce that to the bride. Look, I'm going. I'm not just going never to come back. I'm actually going to make a place ready for you. And I will return for you when that place is ready. So the usual practice was for the young man to return to his father's house and build a honeymoon uh, room there. And we saw that Esau did that, I believe. I believe it was Esau that did that. That he went you know, to his father's house and he built a room and then he went and got a wife and brought her back to the father's house. In the, uh, the ancient uh, Jewish culture, that used to be practiced. But in the contemporary times, I think it's more of a chupa. And the chupa is more like a canopy that is erected in front of the father's house, the groom's uh, father's house. And that's where he would also go back and collect the wife and bring him back to the house. They don't really necessarily build like uh, uh, a, a, a chamber, a wedding chamber anymore, except for, of, of course, for those who can afford it. You know, but the truth we're trying to uh, understand here is that the groom announces that he's going to go and prepare a place and that he's going to return back to collect uh, the, the bride. This is what is symbolized by the chupa or canopy, which is characteristic of Jewish weddings. He was not allowed to skimp on the work and had to get his father's approval before he could consider it ready for his bride. So he goes there, he does all the job that needs to be done, he gets the wedding chamber uh, built, and he gets the father's approval. You see, part of the reason why the man is not able to tell the exact time that he's going to return to collect the bride, because he doesn't know when the project is going to be uh, completed. He doesn't know. It's at the discretion of the father to ensure that, because it's the father's house, it's the father's property, is that it's a discretion of the father to ensure that the wedding chamber is, is built, is completed. So it is when the father says, yes, it is ready, and I'm happy it is ready, then go back and collect the bride, go and collect your wife. If asked the date of his wedding, he would have to reply, if the groom is asked the date of his wedding, he will have to reply, only my father knows. And we know that that's what Jesus said to say of that day, you know, and the time of his, of his coming back. He said he himself does not know that it's only the father that knows. Typically, it would be a year before he came for his bride, typically. Meanwhile, the bride would be making herself ready so that she would be pure and beautiful for her bridegroom. During this time, she would wear a veil. When she went out to show, she had been betrothed. You don't necessarily see her face each time she goes out while she's uh, betrothed, she wears a veil. You see, there is a sense here that because she doesn't know when the groom will come back, there is a sense of readiness, there is a sense of prepare preparedness or preparation 
that goes on in the life of the bride. She doesn't know. So she has to, you know, be pure. She has to keep herself trim and proper and beautiful because the groom can show up at any time. John chapter 14, verses 1 and 2. John 14, 1, 2. Let's see what our bride says, or what our groom says to us as the bride of Christ. Say, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, but I go to prepare a place for you. Let me also add that three to it. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So Jesus Christ, when he was going, he also gave us the same assurance. In my father's house, there are mansions there. You know, there is a wedding chamber there. There are places that I'll have to, I'm going back to prepare a place for you there in my father's house. And once I've done, that preparation is completed, then I will return back to you and then I'll collect you. I'll come again and collect you. And that's why the church have a valid expectation of the coming back of Jesus Christ, his second coming, the rapture. That's the expectation. That is the glorious hope of the church that is coming back because he has given us his word and he has gone to prepare a place. He's coming back for us. And those of us who are alive when he shall return, we shall be cut off to be with, together with the Lord. And the dead in Christ too, those who would have died, by the time he returns, they will arise first. And they will be changed, they will be transformed, and then also to, to be cut off together with the Lord. So at, at present, as Christians, we are in the period between espousal or betrothal and marriage. I want to establish that from scripture. Second Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 to 4. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband. This is Paul talking about the believers that he has preached to. And by God's grace, they have become born again. Christians at Corinth. He said, for I have espoused you to one husband, which is Christ that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Take note, they are a chaste virgin because they are a bride. The wedding is not yet consummated. When Christ comes in, when he returns back, that, you know, part of what he has come into in the rapture to do is to take us up to the mansion. And that, uh, 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 in heaven, one of the events that is going to happen there will be the, 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 uh, uh, the the, the, the marriage, uh, uh, the wedding at which there is going to be, you know, the, 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 the supper. The marriage supper of the Lamb is part of the event that is going to happen, I believe, in heaven. But prior to this, the church is being presented through the gospel as a chaste virgin to Christ, as a bride unto, unto Christ. And then in verse Three, but I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Verse 4 For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear. With him. So what is our responsibility then as the bride of Christ? Those who are expectant and waiting for the coming of Christ. What's our responsibility? There are three uh, uh, points I quickly want to mention, brethren. Number one, we have to prove our continuing loyalty to Christ, our continuing fidelity to Christ. That's very, very important. Remember, Paul said, I've presented you, Corinthian believers, as chaste. Chaste virgin, pure. Chastity there is pure. Pure virgin, unadulterated by sexual immorality, uncontaminated by sexual sin. That's why they are virgin. They have not slept with another man. They, they have not, you know, uh, um, have been sexually involved with another man. They are a bride of Christ, but they are virgin, waiting for the groom to come. So we have to prove that continuing loyalty in our chastity to Christ. That's very key. 
Because by the end of this age, there will be two groups within Christendom. I'm not talking about outside the church, within the church. Two groups. There will be either be the harlot or there will be the bride within Christendom. And we see that in scriptures in Revelation 17. Those two pictures are there. In this end time church, there will be the harlots who are parading themselves as the bride, but they are not. But then there will also be the true bride. Revelation 17, verses 1 to 2. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great hall that seated upon many waters. The great hall, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth, they have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Verses 5 to 6. six. And upon her forehead, remember it's a woman. It's represented by a woman. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon, the grave, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So this is the harlot church. This is the harlot church, the Mystery Babylon. And in verse 6, and I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And then, so that's a picture of the harlot who will be in the church. It will be, it will be, it will be the, the polluted church, the, 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 the church that is given to wardom and to harlotry. We will parade themselves as being members of the true church, but they are not. But the members of the true church will be the bride of Christ in, Ephes in Revelation 21. Revelation 21, verses 9 to 10. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit, to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So there is the true bride. Then number two, also, there is a sense of expectancy, brethren, that we need to have. You must be expectant. Christ is coming as a bridegroom, but he's not coming just for any kind of the bride or any kind of the church. He's coming for an expectant church. It's very, very key. That sense of expectation. Once the bridegroom in the HR Jewish culture told the, the bride, look, I'm coming back again. From that moment, she, she's expectant. Because she doesn't know when he's going to come. Yes, she's expectant. Looking forward to the day that he's going to appear. And we also need to be expectant. Otherwise, we don't believe really that he's going to come back if we are not expectant. Hebrews chapter 9, verse twenty. Eight. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him. The scripture is very emphatic. Unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. It's not going to appear to everyone. Whether we call ourselves Christians or not, no. He's only going to appear in his second coming unto them that look for him. To them who are expectant. They are expecting him to come. And you can see it. It's just like the picture of expectation that I see. It's this picture of the prodigal father, the father of the prodigal son, who after the son had wandered off. But actually, we are not told from scriptures. But for him to have run afar off, when he saw him coming afar off, must mean that he was expectant. Paraventure, every day or every other day, he's going outside, looking in the horizon, whether this prodigal son is going to appear. That's the picture of expectancy. Because the day that the boy shows up, in why at a great distance, the father ran off time. So he must have been outside looking. And that's the picture of expectancy. It must be demonstration in our pursuits. It must be demonstration in our actions. It must be demonstrated in our commitment. If you are not serving the God in the kingdom, in the way we should serve, then you, there's no basis for saying that you're expectant. If we are not preaching the gospel, what's the evidence for that we expect them? Because these are the things that will erase his coming. These are the things that will you know, facilitate his coming. He said the gospel is preached to all the world and then the end will come. 
you know, and Christ is waiting for us to fulfill this. Say, occupy till I come. If you are not occupying for Christ, then that should say an unexpected. If you are not watching on to prayer, we are not expecting. So there are things that God wants us to do to show our, our sense of preparedness and expectation for the coming of our Lord and our Savior. And of course, um, I will quickly read Matthew 25. I know time is uh, past then. Um, Matthew 25. It's um, a story I believe we are quite familiar with. So I'm not really going to read. Is the is the uh, the the ten virgins? You know the parable of the ten virgins, um, which shows that uh, the wise had oil in their vessels and they had sufficient to you know extras, whereas the foolish ones they didn't. They only had you know enough that will carry them thus far, and because the bridegroom delayed, they didn't have any uh, you know they didn't have a reservoir if I can use that word. And so verses 5 to 6 says, But while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. So this is also an illustration of this same Jewish, ancient uh, Jewish uh, practice. Because the bridegroom was going to return, so the brides and uh, uh, the maidens in our bride chamber, you know, the bridal train, the maidens there, they were all expecting and they were waiting. But some had, you know, enough, and then with extras, and the, about five of them, and the other five, they didn't have, you know, extras. Yeah, and the Bible said they were foolish. And because the bridegroom tarried, and they didn't know exactly when he was going to come, they ran out. And while they went, you know, in search of, you know, oil, the bridegroom came at that time. That means they were not really prepared as they ought to. And unfortunately, he only took into his chambers those that were ready alongside the bride. And also take note too that there was an announcement made and at midnight there was a cry made. So there's going to be an announcement. That's why the Bible says, at the trump of God, there's going to be an angel heralding is coming. A cry was made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. So behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. My prayer is that when that cry is going to be made, where the trump of God shall sound, we'll be expectant, we'll be ready prepare to hear it. It's part of looking for his coming. We'll be alert to hear it, sensitive to catch it, and also be counted worthy to be caught up uh, with the Lord in the rapture in Jesus' name. Now, the third thing I want us to do is our preparation is to translate imputed righteousness into at work righteousness and sanctification. Um, all this is saying is that when we are born again, there is a righteousness that God gives us. That is the righteousness of Christ. That we receive by faith. That's imputed to us. It's a gift. However, as we begin to, you know, walk in that consciousness, the Holy Spirit also begins to work that righteousness out in us. And that's why it says we have to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. So that it's not just a salvation that we receive by gift, but also it's, uh, sorry, a righteousness we receive by gift. It will also be a righteousness that is worked out in our daily obedience to the word of God, in our doing God's will on a daily basis. That's the outworking of that righteousness. It is God that works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And the Bible also says that we should work out our salvation. So that is very key that we have a responsibility to, to demonstrate the righteousness that we have received as gift in our work. And First John chapter 2 verses two to three two to three so, and he is the appropriate first john two i beg your pardon um you'll be first john three two to three beloved now are we the sons of god and it does not yet appear what we shall be like but we know that when he shall appear we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is and every man that had this hope in him Purified himself, even as he is pure. There is no greater motivation, brethren, to live a holy life, a sanctified life, than the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is why churches who don't preach the rapture, I feel for them. There is no motivation. How would the people, the congregation, how would they want to prepare themselves and live the life, you know, you know, that is acceptable? When they don't even know that Christ is coming back for them, and where he's taking them to is a glorious place. It's a place. You know, uh, that, you know, it's of uh, holiness. Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 to 8. Revelation 19, 
7 to 8. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come. This is now an event that is taking place in heaven, the actual marriage. That would happen at some point in the future. See, for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. She's prepared herself. She's, she's, she's ready. And how was she made ready? Verse 8. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. That's without spot, without blemish. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Brethren, what that is saying, that the condition for partaking, for being married to Christ, the, the, the requirement, brethren, is that the bride of Christ will be arrayed in righteousness. The robe of righteousness, clean and white, fine linen, you know, she has to be arrayed. And that is the necessary condition for that marriage to take place in heaven. There is a picture here that uh, is in Matthew chapter 22. I'll just read a few verses because of time. Uh, but we can read from verses 1 to 14 um, when we do have the chance to do so. Uh, Matthew 22. But I'll just dwell on the latter part of it for us to see something that happened. Um, in verse 11, and when the king came in to see the guests, these are people that have been invited you know, to a wedding, and they were all told to come in a particular dress, dress that is fit for the wedding. And when the king came in to see the guests, he thought that there was a man which had not, which had not on, on a wedding garment. Take note, brethren, that everyone was invited. Everybody came here with an invite. And so salvation is not a problem here. They, they, we, have, we have all been called unto Jesus. So we are all saved in a sense. But however, in addition to having the invitation to the kingdom, there is another essential requirement, which is being clothed with a garment, fit for the wedding. Verse 20, so this man was there in the crowd as an invited guest, but he didn't have on the wedding garment. Verse 12, and he, the king, said unto him, Friend, how comest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I believe that invitation is salvation. But the wedding garment is that righteousness part, that sanctification, being set apart unto Christ. Sanctification. We are just set apart. I've been espoused. I have no other dwelling with any other man, no contamination with the world. My garment is white. I'm a chaste virgin of Jesus Christ, and I'm set apart waiting for the bride to come and take me. That is sanctification. That is the garment that we have to wear. Otherwise, that rejection you know, can happen to uh, any one of us if we don't have that garment on. Uh, fire, the last bit is the, uh, the fourth stage is actually the wedding proper. When the wedding chamber was ready, the bridegroom could collect the bride, his bride. He will now go back and then collect the bride. He could do this at any time. So the bride would make special arrangements. It was a custom for a bride to keep a lamb. And we have seen that in the story of the five virgins and the uh, uh, sorry, ten virgins. Um, avail and uh, other things beside our bed. All of those things will be kept beside our bed. Our bridesmaids were also waiting and have to have oil ready for their lambs. When the groom and his friends got close to the bride house, they will give a shout and blow a shofar. The shofar is a trumpet to let her know to be ready. And that's why the angel will blow when Jesus comes too. When the wedding party arrived at the father's house, the newlyweds went into the wedding chamber for a seven-day honeymoon. And the groom's best friend stood outside waiting for the groom to tell him that the marriage had been consummated. Then all the friends really started you know, celebrating for the seven days that the couple were honeymooning. When the couple emerged, there would be much congratulation and the marriage supper would begin. It is at this point, brethren, that marriage is actually consummated. This is the point when marriage actually takes place. All the other ones are the preliminary stages to wedding. I'll just read one uh, scripture because of my time, which is gone. It's in Songs of Solomon, chapter 1, 
verse 4. Say, draw me, we will run after thee. The king had brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in thee. We will remember thy love more than wine, the upright love thee. So it is the uh, joy of the bridegroom to return and take the bride back to his father's house and into the chamber that he has gone to prepare and they will be there for seven days. And we know that also in the rapture, when Jesus comes, he's taking us back to heaven. And we believe, you know, from a revelation of scriptures that it's going to be a period of seven years. It's not seven days, but it's seven years that the saints of God will be with Christ in heaven. And in, in, uh, it is uh, uh, during this period too that the marriage uh, between Christ and the bride will take place uh, in heaven. Finally, what then is the relevance for us as uh, members of the body? What's the relevance for us? The relevance, brethren, is that we need to be in regular fellowship to encourage one another, to strengthen one another, to sharpen one another. And that's what Hebrews chapter 10, 25, 23 to 25 tells us, that we should not forsake the assembling together of ourselves. Iron is, uh, sharpens iron, so that that will help us to keep our focus right, focus on Christ. That will help us in our preparedness. It will help us to work out our, our salvation with fear and trembling. The Lord bless uh, the study of his words in our hearts and our minds in Jesus' name. Shall we pray? Father, we want to thank you. We want to give you glory. We appreciate you, Father, for what you have shown to us, uh, uh, us in scriptures tonight about the price that Jesus paid, the, 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 his shed blood to buy us, to buy us unto himself. We thank you, Father, Lord God, because we know that he's coming for a glorious church, a church without spot, a church without wrinkle. Lord God, we pray for grace that you will remove from us every, every blood, every wrinkle, Lord, that might still be inherent in our nature, in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray, Lord, tonight we, our story will not become at the rapture. When Christ comes for the bride, those foolish virgins who are not watchful, would they have in, enough uh, oil, they run out of the anointing, the anointing that will keep them on their toes, the anointing that will make them, you know, to be up and green for Christ, the anointing that will enable them to live the life that is pleasing, you know, before the, uh, before the Father, we, our oil will never run dry in Jesus' name, our garment shall always be white, it won't be the story of the man that was invited, he had salvation, he had an invite, but for some reason, he left his garment at, uh, at home, his white wedding garment, that will not be our experience. But at the return of the master, we shall be found blameless. We shall be found pure. We shall, we shall be found, Lord, without fault in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord God, tonight. Lord, that when that trumpet shall sound, Father, count us worthy in Jesus' name. Lord, that will not be part of those that will be left behind and will go through, Lord, perdition and tribulation such as never, Lord God, been recorded in the history. Lord God of mankind, that will not be our experience in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you. We bless you. We give you glory. We worship you. We exalt your name. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed.